Confessions 36. Must I not consider this too as one of the faults which I ought to despise? Can anything restore me to hope except your mercy? That you are merciful I know, for you have begun to change me. You know how great the change you have worked in me, for first of all you have cured me of the desire to assert my claim to liberty, so that you may also pardon me all my other sins, heal all my mortal ills, rescue my life from deadly peril, crown me with the blessings of your mercy, content all my desire for good. You know how great the change you have worked in me, for you have curbed my pride by teaching me to fear you, and you have tamed my neck to your yoke. And now that I bear your yoke, I find its burden light, for this was your promise, and you have kept your word. In truth, though I did not know it, it was light even in the days when I was afraid to bend my neck to it. But, O oh Lord, you who alone rule without pride, since you are the only true Lord, and no other Lord rules over you, there is a third kind of temptation which I fear has not passed from me. Can it ever pass from me in all this life? It is the desire to be feared or loved by other men simply for the pleasure that it gives me, though in such pleasure there is no true joy. It means only a life of misery and despicable vainglory. It is for this reason more than any other that men neither love you nor fear you in purity of heart. It is for this reason that you thought the proud and keep your grace for the humble. This is why with a voice of thunder you condemn the ambitions of this world so that the very foundations of the hills quail and quake. This is why the enemy of our true happiness persists in his attacks upon me, for he knows that when men hold certain offices in human society, it is necessary that they should be loved and feared by other men. He sets his traps about me, baiting them with tributes of applause, in the hope that in my eagerness to listen I may be caught off my guard. He wants me to divorce my joy from the truth and place it in man's duplicity. He wants me to enjoy being loved and feared by others, not for your sake, but in your place, so that in this way he may make me like himself and keep me to share with him not the true fellowship of charity, but the bonds of common punishment. For he determined to set his throne in the north where chilled and benighted men might serve him as he imitates you in his perverse, distorted way. But we, O oh Lord, are your little flock. Keep us as your own. Spread your wings and let us shelter beneath them. Let us glory in you alone. If we are loved or feared by others, let it be for your sake. No man who seeks the praise of other men can be defended by men when you call him to account. Men cannot save him when you condemn. But it happens too not that praise is given to the man who is proud of his wicked end achieved, or that the evildoer wins applause, but that a man is praised for some gift which you have given him. And if he takes greater joy in the praise which he receives than in the possession of the gift for which men praise him, then the price he pays for their applause is the loss of your favour, and he, the receiver of praise, is worse off than the giver. For the one finds pleasure in God's gift in man, while the other finds less pleasure in God's gift than in the gift of men.